Hello there, movie fans. Welcome to More Movies Podcast, number 59. On the outside, number 59 is Jack Ham. Hello, bienvenue. Welcome to the podcast where we like to talk about all things movies, films, cinema. My name's Greg Fisher. Sitting next to me is my good friend and colleague, David Roberts. How are you doing today, our Dave? I'm pretty damn good, sir. I'm pretty damn good. We are here in the height of summer, and I'm feeling very pink. <laughs> well... It's not only because it's summer are you feeling a little pink. This weekend, we went to see Barbie and Oppenheimer. So in this episode, we're going to be talking about Barbenheimer. So yeah, we went to see both movies this weekend and some more, but we'll probably talk about them another time. This week, we're just going to focus on Barbie and Oppenheimer. I thought, Dave, we would talk about Barbie first and Oppenheimer afterwards, and then maybe a little bit of compare and contrast at the end just before we finish. What do you reckon? Sounds very good to me, sir. Sounds very good to me. So these are two movies we've been looking forward to for a long, long time. Obviously, the build-up has been pretty, you know, heavy as of recent. You know, we had trailers drop for both movies just a month or two ago. Everybody's getting fired up. I'd say we were probably equally excited about both these movies. What do you reckon to that? Um, yes, I, I mean, I was very excited for both. Maybe slightly more Oppenheimer for me, just because it's Nolan and I'm such a Nolan fan. But um, yeah, I was excited for them both. And uh, I think all these kind of, um, this kind of two camp thing that got betrayed on the internet by people, you know, kind of, Oh, I'm only going to see Barbie, or oh, I'm only going to see Oppenheimer. It was it was a bit childish. I mean, I think if you if you love film, you watch both. Yeah, exactly. And we are firmly in that camp of being excited for both. Obviously, you know, Barbenheimer became a bit of an internet phenomena. Um, you know, the boat as soon as it was mentioned that both movies would be released on the same weekend, it sort of you know generated this whole thing, uh, which the internet does best. It kind of takes over from it. So that yeah. produced hilarious images, some of which I'll put up on the screen now, which mash up the two films together. We can see Barbie and Oppenheimer, or Oppie, as we might know him, uh, in a speedboat together. And, uh, you know, all of that stuff. It's so much fun. It just, it is. it's like an organic way to really sort of build the hype for the movie, uh, or for the movies, I should say. And um, I've enjoyed that just as much as, you know, watching yeah. the films themselves, just watching the internet reactions to them. Like you said, there, there's been a lot of people like two camps that prefer one or the other. Fair enough, you know. I mean, Barbie's not going to be everyone's cup of tea and neither is Oppenheimer. For some people, that would be maybe, you know, possibly a little bit dry, a little bit boring, historical drama. They're not interested in it. I understand that. I equally understand why some people aren't interested in Barbie. It's just not their cup of tea. But like we've already said, we were into both. We've now seen both. So let's start ourselves off with Barbie 2023, directed by Greta Gerwig, written by Greta Gerwig and her partner, Noah Birnbach, a great filmmaker in his own right. Um, it stars Margot Robbie in the lead role as generic Barbie, shall we call her, or a stereotypical Barbie, <laughs> as she refers to herself in the film. And there's also Ryan Gosling as Ken. But there's also lots of other... Barbies and Kens in the film. Hi Barbie. 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 Hi Ken. There is lawyer Barbie, um, author Barbie, Doctor Barbie, the rest of it, and there's also lots of other Kens in the film. I can. I can. I can. I can. I got us both ice cream. Cool. And these are characters that all exist in a fictitious dimension called Barbie Land, uh, where they are. Yeah. It's like they are the toys that uh, children are playing with, but they're also sort of like, you know, as we observe them, humans living in their little Barbie land. Um, so you've got loads of different Barbies, loads of different Kens, and they just live in this sort of like crazy Barbie land world where Barbie is boss and Ken is just there really to um, to support Barbie, to, uh, to be her stand, to be her, you know, admirer, and not much of anything else. But, of course, we also have the real world where we all exist. And in that world, you've got all sorts of characters and uh, people like Will Ferrell playing the CEO of Mattel. Uh, you've got America Ferrara. She is uh, the owner of Margot Robbie's Barbie, we find out. Um, 
because there's some stuff there that sort of interconnects them because Barbie and, as it turns out, Ryan Gosling's Ken end up uh, making that journey from Barbie land into our world and therein is the kind of um, the plot that unravels. Uh, you also had Kate McKinnon in, in, um, in Barbie land as weird Barbie, which was hilarious and funny you know the kind of barbie where <laughs> girls cut the hair off and play with them too hard i think it's said uh, and they become just like you know drawn on and maybe a foot missing or something like that it's like weird barbie always doing the splits very very funny stuff but yeah barbie and ken make it into our world and um things start to go awry for for our toys unfortunately as is Probably ex- expected coming into our world, you know, the worst yes. planet in the universe. <laughs> but um, you know, would you say that's a fair setup for this movie, Dave? Uh, am I yeah, it? pretty much. That's that's exactly it, really. It's kind of like an existential Toy Story, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. and, it, and it's uh, you know, the it's an in, it's an interesting. Um, kind of way they set up the film because obviously it's about these two worlds the real world and uh barbie world and obviously they kind of do it as the um they, they're the inverse of each other it's the barbie and the girls are in charge and uh, have made the the perfect barbie world um society and uh then of course they show the our world which historically has been more male dominated uh the patriarchy and all that and that so that they have this huge contrast um between the two and that kind of that's the bubble of the movie really isn't it that um fred's effing along um but yeah so barbie and ken make their journey and and it's it's very nice actually because the the set design and the clothes design of barbie world itself is amazing obviously done a, a great job and it's all that kind of yeah, this, these are all toys. That's the joke of it all. Nothing is, is quite real. Um, and then they have the gritty kind of real world uh, world that they, they journey to. And it's there's a real contrast that you don't even have to say much. You can just change the scene and you know which land you are in, you know. Yeah. So in Barbie land, of course, everything's based on the toys. Like you can buy Barbie's house, Barbie's car you know, the pool, everything about it, even the beach is like a a little toy set. And uh, Greta Gerwig said that, you know, she was inspired by um, theatre and theatrical films, films like uh, The Red Shoes um, and stuff like that, that's got a very sort of theatrical look where you might have a painted backdrop, but that's actually there, that's being filmed. You know, it's not a CGI backdrop, it's there, but it's obviously fake, but at the same time, it's got a sort of, uh, you know, uh, tangible uh, existence in the sense yes. that, you know, yeah, it's all yeah. real. And, you know, there's that scene at the start where they're on the beach and Ken decides that he's going to impress Barbie that day to run into the sea. And when he hits those waves, because they're just solid, he bounces back off. You know? Yeah, it's a, it's a brilliant but, scene, that one. But yeah, it really does give that Barbie land world, uh, a, you know, a really authentic uh, feeling to it all. Because even though it's a, like all kind of plastic and fake, it's just so well realized when, you know, you've got to be familiar with the toys of your if you're living um, on planet earth you, you know one's escaped barbie uh, <laughs> at some point in their lifetime and you know all these ideas as well like she takes a shower there's no water coming out but she's it's, yeah you know like you would when you were playing she drinks and there's there's no liquid in the cup there's nothing yeah and all of these ideas set up really that that um, really good contrast that there's going to be in the real world you know the first time she takes a drink and all the liquid goes all over her face and she's like oh she's not used to it yet but I think you're absolutely spot on. It's like an existential Toy Story. That's a good sort of um, way to put it <laughs> because this is one of the sort of main um, themes of the film, I felt, was is that Barbie goes through this existential crisis. That's what kind of causes this uh, odyssey for her to, to start making her journey to the real world is all of a sudden she has this weird thought about, does anybody think uh, about uh, we're all going to die? Well, think about yeah. death, you know what I mean? And it's this like deep philosophical question that everybody in this perfect world is suddenly like, huh, what? You know, what are you talking about? Who talks about that? You yeah. know, it's, well, it doesn't even occur to them, you know, and it's uh, 
very much, you know, something that starts to perturb her. You know, I like the idea that um, she suddenly gets flat feet. <gasps> flat feet! Because <laughs> all the Barbie dolls have these kind of like, you know, standing on their toes so she could wear the stilettos and stuff like that. And then suddenly she's got flat feet and that's like the weirdest thing to all the other Barbies. And they have to go and see weird Barbie for advice, you know, what's wrong with her and all this. Oh, you need to go to the, uh, you need to go to the real world. And um, yeah, absolutely brilliant um, sort of concept, I thought. Because obviously, as we said as well, uh, Ryan Gosling's Ken goes with her because he's absolutely obsessed with her. But when he gets there, like you said, it's like this world of... Um, dominated by the patriarchy and he gets sort of like a juvenile um idea of what the patriarchy is um he thinks it's all to do with like horses riding horses and being yeah. you know uh, super cool and being macho and he can't believe it because he comes from a world where he's kind of just like you know dominated by women his only existence is to worship barbie um and then suddenly he's in a world where all these guys are, you know everybody gives him respect he says and you know guys get to drive the cool cars and do all the cool stuff. So to him, the idea of the patriarchy is like this simplified thing where, hey, I get to be super cool. I get to be, you know, my own sort of like boss in a way. And and he can get um, uh, pulled in by all that, doesn't he? Yeah. Uh, he, uh, and his performance is great in it. And, and the whole... Um journey for ken and the other kens uh is is really fascinating um and there's a really good commentary over the top of it that's done in a really clever way to me of the kind of bro culture uh that um excessive machismo you know it's really taking it to task the kind of stupid over the top um masculinity that it's really um poking fun at um but you know, you, you take the whole film, and it's interesting because we've obviously we've seen uh, now comments from other uh, critics and reviewers and stuff like that, and, and people online talking about it. And um, you know, I think some people are, are missing the point of it. It's like it starts with these two inverse worlds. You know, one of the hyper masculinity, um, one of the hyper femininity, and in the end. The, ho the whole thing about the existential crisis of Barbie is neither of those are good. A compromise is where the journey wants to be to be taken. Um, but I, I think people have kind of missed those points. But it's a very um, inspired film as well. And I think the other thing I'd, I'd said, said but like people saying, oh, it's going to be a kid's movie. And I said, it's not a kid's movie. This is a, this is going to be something more. Um, and it very much proved that it was what it's talking about is, you know, it's a very philosophical film. It's a social commentary. It's it's all these things that we thought it'd be. And it's um, kind of contextual layers, you know, with 2001 A Space Odyssey, uh, The Godfather, uh, The Matrix. You know, it's not talking about kids films when it's referencing, it's referencing, you know, adult cinema, you know, which it does a really great job of, I think, you know, scattering in these different different references for everyone to take off and um but it does it in a way that you think kids can still watch this you know there's lots of song and dance numbers there's funny stuff they they'd get along with it um even the kind of adult jokes throughout it which are which are some very funny moments um it treads a line that is well kid, kids wouldn't know what they're talking about you know but we all can have a giggle about it you know let's be off. Anyone who wants to beach him off has to beach me off first. I will beach both of you off at the same time. So the, I think the, the the genius that Greta Work Gehrig has actually pulled off here is creating a film that can very finely run that line of being, yeah, this works fine for kids, um, but is a, something that's got a message for, for adults to sit there and talk about. Just like The Simpsons. You know, it's got it is, all, yeah. all those jokes that, you know, like you say, kids can watch it as a kid's cartoon, but it's got all, all, all the stuff for the adults as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the amount of films that played an influence in it, you know, Umbrellas of Sherbrooke was another one, you know, and you can yeah. see that in terms of the costume design and the set design and all of the art direction in the film in that sense. 
um, authentic artificiality, I think, as as she put it, which I thought was a, a cool way to um, describe it. Cool. Uh, one of the most impressive parts of it for me was uh, the fact that Mattel signed off on everything um, because, you know, um, you'd think that it's quite, kind of hypercritical uh, in some ways of Mattel as a corporation and, and of Barbie herself in other ways, you know, where... Uh, like Barbie finds out that not all women love her and not all women have been liberated and are, you know, completely uh, free in the real world, you know, and that, that Barbie dolls are kind of, especially in a modern context, problematic in the terms of how they uh, portray our ideas of beauty and the rest of it. And um, this is, comes as, like you say, it's an existential threat to Barbie. It's a real shock to her because she's so lovely and she's just so uh, sweet and nice always that, you know, when these like bitter and dark elements uh, start to infect her existence. It's, a, it's a, you know, it is a real sort of like a problem for her. But the one of the people that was working closely with Gerwig uh, from Mattel, uh, I, uh, I've got a quote. They, they said, uh, being safe in this world doesn't work. So they were actually really trusting of her to, to do the things that she did uh, in the film. And... Um, I think that's brilliant that, you know, yeah. a, a huge corporation like that that's responsible for this whole IP of Barbie, which is a massive multi-million dollar business, has been for years, still is now. They were smart enough to know, let her do her thing and we'll take out any any uh, flack on the chin and we'll make millions and millions of dollars. <laughs> that's, the, that's, you know, it is. that's it's the what's clever. happened. It's the clever thing to do, and, and high praise for the people who signed off and went, yeah, do yeah. it. Uh, you know, round of applause, because it could have very easily been held back and become, uh, you know, a, a two-hour advert for Barbie. And, yeah, and, you know, I think that's what a lot of people think it is. Yeah, and it's like, but it's it really isn't, is it? It's, no. it as you say, it's a very, it is making a point. Um, and I think... Making you know, lots of points, they, really. It makes lots of points, but it, it knows... I think Mattel know as as well as all of us that you know the kind of stereotypical image of Barbie is stuck fifty years ago, and so that's the point that it's trying to make a criticism at. And I'm sure that them as a company, I, I don't follow Barbie obviously, <laughs> and what they're doing there now, but I'm sure they're probably doing more um, progressive um, things with the toys. But there's obviously a lot of points to be made historically that have uh, are being made. Um, within the film about, you know, a toy that, yeah, as you say, it has been historically problematic and stuff. Well, like you said but, as well uh, about uh, there being the Barbie land world and the real world. And, and you know, it's implied that, that as, you know, meeting in the middle is the best thing. There's balance not to have too uh, much extreme on either end. Well, that's kind of like worked its way into the real world with this, uh, the company doing that, that, you know, they've, they've, They've said, you know, well, we, we're going to have to allow a certain amount of criticism uh, yeah. in order to, to get the best results, you know. So um, I'm sure that uh, Greta Gerwig had to make some compromises here and there. But, oh, absolutely. But, yeah, yeah. but you know, uh, I think she pretty much had, you know, otherwise carte blanche to just get on with it. They trusted her as an artist to do it. And this is what's really great. That's an exciting thing that all of these other corporations that seem to dominate our lives in so many ways could learn a, a lot of lessons from this, that if they relinquish a little bit of um, power in that sense or artistic control, they're going to reap the dividends because this movie has gone ballistic. It's it made yeah. over $160 million on opening weekend. It's, it's made uh, $350 million worldwide, maybe more. It's just huge, you know, huge amount of money that it's made. They could, they could. Uh, I think that's right. But just a lot of lessons can be learned for for other people. I mean, essentially, I think the film is uh, it's an inverse Wizard of Oz. Um, even as you say about the kind of theatrical kind of set looking, if you think of Wizard of Oz and the sure. Oz, it's a very, it's a it's a world that's very theatrical and with the sets. But there's that thing, isn't it, about those kind of worlds that. If it's done well, you believe everything. You sucker into it, um, yeah. And and that's that's where cinema comes magic. Yeah. Um, I think the star of the show, though, um, I was really I really enjoyed Will Ferrell in it. I was just surprised to me. I didn't know he was going to be in it, mm. um, and he was hilarious. But the star of the show, of course, 
which Michael Shearer is uh, Alan. Uh, well, there we go. We've got Alan as well. There's all these Kens, but there's only one Alan. And this is like <laughs> referencing the toys as well, because, you know, they, they will have brought out all these different Kens, but there was only this one Alan doll at one point. Alan. And um, and that's the kind of joke they play on these jokes, which is really funny. You don't even have to know much about it to get what's going on. But yeah, yeah. Michael Sarah as Alan. I mean, everyone's saying uh, Ryan Gosling as Ken, and that's absolutely right. He, st- he steals the, the entire show in a sense. Because he gets the ballad, the song, you know, the power ballad. He gets oh, all, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's 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 kind of like um, it becomes Ken's story as much as Barbie's through him. But yes, you're absolutely right. Michael Sarah as Alan is like the the underdog in a way, the unexpected latecomer that just sort of like uh, really puts his mark on the film. And I was I was laughing out loud at, at, at some of the scenes with him in it. Absolutely brilliant. But, yeah. but Gosling, all the way, man. Gosling was just, you know... You could just tell even with the trailers before it was released and stuff, just the little snippets. Of, so cool. All this stuff, you just think, this guy has committed to it 100%. You know, apparently Greta Gerwig and Margaret Robbie said, we can't have anyone else. It's got to be Ryan Gosling. If he, if he says he doesn't want to do it, we're going to have to kidnap him or something and make him do it. But <laughs> you can see why, in it, He's just perfect as that sort you of You can tell thing. he loves it. Oh, yeah. He that, loves the sort of, the like, um, tongue-in-cheekness of it all, if that's yeah. the thing, you know. But, yeah. yeah. He fully embraced it. It, 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 it was wonderful. He got um, loads of other cameos in there. I mean, loads. I mean, this is another way that the two films are very similar, that the cast was so extensive, even though some of them only appear in just for a minute or two. You've got John Cena in there. You've got oh, uh, yes. even people like Rob Brydon, a Welsh comedian that maybe a lot of Americans don't know. But we know all about him over here. But I was surprised to see him in there. You know, it's like, yeah, oh, my God, it was Rob Brydon. Rob Brydon. Uh, you got Rhea Perlman, who I thought was brilliant as the creator of Barbie. So you had this almost like this sort of, um, it's almost like Barbie's meeting God in a way. It's meeting the person or a mother figure uh, that, you know, created her. And those scenes between um, Margot Robbie and Rhea Perlman, I thought that, also gave the movie a lot, a lot of gravitas. And we've mentioned the guys a lot, but it's you've got to give props to Margot Robbie as her performance oh, was flawless because, it, you know, she, of course she's beautiful. Of course she's that, you know, stereotypical Barbie-looking girl, blonde hair, perfect looks and figure and all that. But she brought the emotion. She really did. Uh, there was moments where you really felt sorry for a character because she is, you know... She's suffering, and she did a great job of of um, portraying that. So, perfect casting all the way. It it was it was champagne casting. It was it kind of the, the first time they announced it. You go, of course, Margot Robbie. That that is Barbie. You know, if you mm. if you were to pick someone out, but she's a fantastic actress anyway. You she know, is. and um, everything she's in, she's just brilliant for that. Even if the film's terrible, so. Um, well, something like was, I Tonya, you know, that goat that really showed. For me, watching her, she was much more than just a, a really great looking girl that you plop, yes. plop into a film like uh, Wolf of Wall Street just to be the gorgeous wife and give Leo DiCaprio a hard time. She carried I, Tonya from start to finish and it was amazing. So she was able to bring a little bit of that into this film as well, as well as being a like great dancer and doing all the moves. Doing all the bits, yeah. Brilliant. I mean, they were, that was another great part of it, this uh, multifaceted movie. All of that um, singing and dancing uh, set pieces were, were brilliantly oh, choreographed, no. put together. They, they were spot on. They really they really nailed it. Um, and they really nailed the balance of of doing that without like the whole film becoming um, an over overstretched dance number. You know, it yeah. was like just, just the right times. Um, but yeah, wonderful experience. Fantastic. Um, Top the only one to watch. Yeah, absolutely. Advise it. You know, anyone who's like uh, open minded enough to to go and see it. You know, who's not already a fan, go and see it. You'll have a great time. You'll laugh your ass off. It's fantastic. So that brings us round to the second big movie of this weekend, Oppenheimer, directed by Christopher Nolan. It was written also by Christopher Nolan uh, and based on the book American Prometheus. 700 page tone that is you know packed full of scientific history uh that's kind of what he's based it on so they get some writing credits as well 
Uh, music by Ludwig Gurunson, who he's worked with before on Tenet, who also did the uh, music for We Are The Millers. Can you believe that? Really? Yeah. As well as The Mandalorian and Boba Fett and probably loads of other stuff as well. But yeah. yeah. Great music in it. Um, now, starring Killian Murphy in the uh, titular role of J. Robert Oppenheimer. And a whole slew of stars, mostly guys. So we'll firstly say it also has Florence Pugh and Emily Blunt, who were both excellent in it. But then we've Amazing. got Robert Downey Jr., Josh Hartnett, Matt Damon, Casey Affleck, Rami Malek, Jason Clark, Kenny B, Kenny Branagh, the B-Man, uh, Benny Safdie, uh, David Dashmalian, or Dashmalchian, whatever, however you say his name, Eldon Ehrenreich, glad to see him in there, he's a great actor, Tom Conti as Einstein, Gary Oldman, remember that, as Harry S. Truman, we didn't talk about it, but I meant to say to you, it was great yeah. to see him. Uh, Tony Goldwyn, Matthew Modine, and plus, and plus, and plus, the list goes on. Who wasn't in this movie? It would take us less time to say. It was. It was a, literally watching the film when someone comes on the screen, you go, oh, it's, oh, it's, oh, it's. Yeah. It was incredible. I mean, it's a long film, so there was plenty yeah. of room to squeeze all these people in. Um, but Killian Murphy in the main role. Typical Chris Nolan fashion. We don't just go chronologically from start to finish. We're, we're you know, black and white uh, stuff that's happening, you know, in the 1950s, back to the 1920s when he's studying, then jump into the 1930s or the 1940s and the 50s again. And we're all over the place, but, you know, not to the point where it's like, oh, I'm confused with what's going on. I thought once you sort of get into the each timeline, of which there are about four, three or four running, he kind of you settle into it. You know what's going on. But yeah, fantastic. He's such a master at that now that, you know, that's the way it's sort of unfurled and you just go with it, you know. Even the, the changes from black and white to colour um, were not really, you know, noticed after a while. You, you know, a lot of no. the Robert Downey Jr. stuff uh, is in black and white if not all of it. And that's the sort of um, contrast between, you know, the past that they're referring to, because that's probably the most um, contemporary uh, timeline we've got going on. Uh, and all the rest is sort of like reference, referencing a, a past that has already happened, which is all in colour, you know? Yeah. Um, I think uh, it's interesting you say about the, the, the way it's edited and obviously we've got the black and white sequence with Robert Downey Jr., which is a really fascinating um, kind of sequence it's a, it is on itself um the difference there is supposed to be um the the color sequences are subjective they're from Oppenheimer's point of view the black and white sequences there uh, the objective uh, sequences that are done uh, later that that's supposed to be the difference the the uh, perspective of it and I think it works really well it gives this kind of pronged attack if, you know you think think films like Dunkirk uh, for Nolan and stuff where You've got all these different um, things going on over a day, over an hour, over a day of a week in Dunkirk, and, and you, you cut them all together to the point where you're revealing information um, piece at a time to reach a, a point, to reach a, 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 a finality of it. And that's what he's doing here. You never find, you're never revealing pieces of information until there's some moments near the end, which we won't spoil, where you go, ah, oh, ah, oh, you know, it's things start to tie. And um, and, I've, and it is, yeah, no one's become the kind of master of u- utilising um, those methods. And I think it works really well because, you know, this could have been so dry. This could have been so kind of chronological and you're just there going, it's a bit mm, this. But because it's so intercutting. And what I really enjoyed was, um, whilst the editing, it's something I wanted to pick up on because it this is, you know, no one's known for quick editing anyway, but this is a really um, choppy film in some ways, in terms of it cuts, it cuts, it cuts, it cuts. It doesn't stop. It's relentless in, in some ways. Certainly for the first uh, kind of two acts of the film, um, it slows down after the bomb's gone off. Um, and I think there's a few things going on. I think one is trying to show the kind of internal struggle and the pace to get the bomb done. It's, it's about the state of mind of Oppenheimer and the state of mind of people trying to complete the, the atomic project. But also it's a way that you can then um, 
inject energy into the film because of course again it's a lot of talking there's a lot of scenes with a lot of stuff rattling off and you you think of something like um uh who wrote the west wing um aaron sorkin aaron sorkin kind of um dialogue yeah it's a lot of that that's just it's, it's rattling off and it's rattling off and that of course if you're not careful can can bleed a scene dry unless you're like no let's cut let's cut let's cut uh, and I thought it worked really well. I've seen some criticism of it, but uh, to me, it works really well. It reminded me of Oliver Stone, films like JFK and Nixon. It reminded me of Adam McKay, uh, Don't Look Up and stuff like that. Uh, and Terence Malick, uh, which is a big Nolan influence. He's very influenced by Terence Malick. Uh, that kind of stream of consciousness editing, um, it's very... And, and I think it works really well um, for a film like this. Well, yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I would just add that Goranson's score helps to drive that editing because just chopping it all up could also be quite jarring. But I found that uh, the score, and as you noted, the sound design, you've constantly got those Geiger counter clicks going off. Yeah. But this score is like driving things for what otherwise could be quite, um, like you said, lots of dialogue, lots of... um, scenes between people, relationships unfurling. It, it could possibly get a bit dry, but the, the music with that editing yeah. gave it that urgency and gave you, it was, like you said, relentless was the word because you're almost an hour and a half in, which is an average movie length, but it's only halfway through this film. And you, and you just felt like you, it just hasn't stopped. You're like, oh my God, you're with it the whole way. And I think yeah. for that reason, so such clever filmmaking just on that technical level to use the score and the sound design in conjunction with the editing to drive this story forward and backwards and, st- and forwards and backwards and forwards, you know, as he does. It just kept you gripped. That's it. It's thinking of the uh, the casual viewer that, you know, needs needs help to get through material like this. And yeah. It's, it's very clever. And they say, yeah, the, the sound design and the music, yeah, of course, it, is, it was it was it was incredible. And that kind of, it, 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 the, it, it never really bolted away from you, you know. No, it, it was, was always constantly there. Moving. And um, and the sound design moving with it, because them kind of, you say, the crackles and the, and the, the, the pops and the kind of whizzing, and it's all like around you. It's kind of like you were hovering in your seat, you know. It's kind of like you just like there's never a moment where something stops you. You're not quite sure where you are, and of course, the whole point of it is that it's demonstrating the kind of the reaction of the bomb going off. It's like the the, the seconds before mm. the, the the fireball, you know. It's all those different things that are happening on the micro level, and it's bringing that into the sound. And I, you know, and you think it's so such a clever way to kind of play with, yeah what what you're dealing with absolutely um, but as you say massive cast huge everyone in it fantastic gary oldman <laughs> when he turned up because he's a he's <laughs> he's like it's obviously after they've done the bomb and he's playing truman the president that infamously dropped the bomb on japan um but i remember that when he says to him when he leaves the office don't let that coward back in here or no cry baby because don't let that cry, cry baby, baby yeah. back in here. And that's that's actually what, apparently what he said. It is what he said, yeah. What a, which is so what shocking, isn't it? Son of a bitch, he is. But um, yeah, I mean, you can see why he was in that state by the time uh, it got to that. You know, he'd spent so long concentrating on building the thing. Once it was done, and they were like, "Right, thanks, we'll take that, and we'll just go and kill tens of thousands of people with it." Suddenly, you're like, "Oh shit, yeah, it was a weapon yeah. of mass destruction." I got lost in the uh, in the job, you know what I mean? But um, but, I mean, here's another side of it. The special effects, were none of it was CGI. It was all yeah. filmed for real. Obviously, they didn't let up for Nuke <laughs> to, uh, to film. So that's, Did you not hear about it? <laughs> that's what makes it even more clever that they, yeah. they create that effect by using all of these incredible filmmaking techniques, you know, the foreshortening and sort of trick photography, uh, macro filming, micro filming, you know, all these little um, minutia to, to give this impression of a, a, a quantum field and a, and a, a subatomic uh, realm of all of these little atoms. And then likening that to the patterns that we see in life famously, and that he's looking at the raindrops hitting the pond on the water, and that kind of like cross fades into a real sort of like um, 
microscopic level of atoms and sparks yeah. and stuff going on. And the explosion itself, the way that they must have filmed stuff, you know, a, a modest explosion compared to um, a, a nuclear one, but they, the way that they present it and makes it look so believable as that shows you the power. I think it's Nolan wanting to really hit home the power of nuclear weapons, you know. It's just it like, was... And I, I thought it looked incredible. I mean, the size of it was was actually accurate. If you watch the Trinity test and you compare and you look at that and you go, it was e- exactly right. I've heard some people going, oh, it didn't, didn't seem big enough. But I think the problem is these are people who haven't watched the Trinity test video mm. and they're confusing later nuclear tests, which were far more powerful. Czar bomber or something. The czar bomber or something, yeah, exactly. That's, which is, it, which like, is hydrogen bombs anyway, it's not even... Exactly. It's a, the yeah, same thing. Exactly. It's thermonuclear. You know, we're yeah. talking here the very first explosion, which wasn't even that big in, in now compared to foreign standards, but at the time, you know, they're portraying it as these people going, holy shit. Well, we watched it in IMAX as well. Uh, I'm glad we did that. I mean, when we looked at it and we're going to get seats... It was looking quite busy because we had initially wanted to watch it before Barbie and sort of start with Oppenheimer, then watch Barbie afterwards as a kind of, you know, um, end on a high, so to speak. Turns out we had to do it the other way around because, like I suggested you, should we just watch it in normal 2D? Then you said, no, not for this. We've got It's got to be IMAX. And you were absolutely right. Yeah. Um, and I'm so glad we did because... Uh, it's not just the visuals uh, with IMAX. It is that sound as well. The sound design is just incredible on this movie. The data indicates it may have been a plutonium implosion device. Like the one you built at Los Alamos. And the most important thing really, isn't it, is, is for that bomb scene because they, they drop it, you, you see the visual, and it's amazing, and then there's like 45 seconds to, to a minute of silence. Well, I thought it would be test. 20 seconds because they were 20 miles away from the, yeah. the blast site and sound would move, at, um, you know, uh, a mile a second. A mile a second. So, you know, it was almost like, an, but it, it was a long 20 seconds because you're seeing all this stuff and all this flashing and different shots of people's reaction to that uh, initial light going off. And, and you're almost like, it's so quiet for so long, you forget about the sound and then, Bang! I I, ju- I jumped in the seat. It was yes, such a shock. I was like, oh. myself. even though you know it's coming, it's it it was just like oh my. Well, God. I almost thought it was going on for so long. Is he not going to do the sound? Is he yeah. going? Is he going? It does is feel it, is feel is he, like maybe yeah. it's just they're going to just do the silent but treatment. You know, it it was so kind of you like mesmerized by the screen, and then as you say, it, it hit you. I jumped and jit myself. But, but obviously the, the great thing about it in IMAX is because it goes um, below zero decibels, it's like minus six or something like that. That's um, why you shake yourself at a bow yeah, yeah, It is. <laughs> the, the bass is so low. Yeah. It's, you feel it coming up underneath you and you're just like, oh, my God. You yeah. know? And you think, Jesus. And that, if that's what, what watch it in IMAX, imagine seeing it in real life. You know, it's... it's uh, it's quite something to, to watch, you know. Yeah, well, uh, Killian Murphy, absolutely amazing performance. Definitely Oscar-nominated worthy. If not, you know, we haven't seen everything yet this year, but he's got to be in the... Got to uh, be in the list. If he doesn't win, I'll be very surprised. Or, or if something else comes along, you know, like that just happens to trump it. I, I can't imagine it will, but, you know, he's playing this guy who was a polymath, really. You know, he wasn't just a, a science boffin. He was... You know, uh, he spoke loads of languages. In his spare time, he just learned a language. He could read Sanskrit, for God's sake. He's into poetry. He's into cowboy stuff, like uh, riding horses and going out camping. Uh, he's a, he was a bit of a womanizer as well. He likes the girls and he likes the ponies. But, you know, this guy was responsible for so much more than just a bomb. At, at first, he was one of the forerunners of looking at the quantum field. He was looking at black holes before people even knew what a black hole was. It's interesting because I've seen people criticising, going, oh, we didn't get to see, like, um, the bombings of Japan, for example, near the end of the film, stuff like that. Well, I was also like, that's not what the film's about. The film's about Oppenheimer. Yeah. (laughs) Read the title. Yeah, (laughs) you know, absolutely. Uh, So it's... uh, And I also felt like that that bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki was represented through his... uh, what was going on in his mind afterwards. Yeah. His, His conscience thinking about it 
there was very clever ways uh, that they uh, portrayed that. You know, for example, giving that speech after the successful test. Uh, that, Amazing scene. That was something else. And that's enough. You don't need to see uh, Hiroshima no. and Nagasaki when you can watch that because it's all implied. It's more, there's more, yeah, there's more clever ways that they dealt with that. that yeah. That, uh, you know. It's not um, that type of film anyway. It's not like that no. historical that we're going to go and show every little thing. Like you said, it's about Oppenheimer. Uh, what an amazing performance, Downey Jr. Uh, yeah. Really great in it. Best Everyone's been is- saying that. It's, oh, that's the great performance. And, and it's like, I think, of course, it's a great performance because Downey Jr. has always been great. Uh, if you only know him as Tony Stark, you haven't seen him. You know, years no, and yeah. years ago, he was playing Charlie Chaplin in a Richard Attenborough film. You know, he was the boy wonder before he went a little crazy. Uh, you know, after that, yes, he yeah. got into drugs and he went into jail and all this. Um, he was considered to be the the you know the greatest actor on the rise in America. So it's no surprise that he was great in this. But for me, no. hands down, it's Killian Murphy. Um, oh, Killian Murphy still carried, absolutely... carried carried the film all the way through. It was a phenomenal performance, like you were saying about his the, the amount of emotion he managed and anguish he managed to express just through his his expression and through his eyes. Yeah, was, it, it was yeah, all in the eyes again. Yeah, absolutely. You, you just yeah. Oh. I mean, he's one of those actors as well just think of what he's done with Nolan he was the scarecrow so it's a sort of bad guy or a side character uh, supporting role he was in um, Inception he was uh, the, you know the people that he's the person they do the Inception on so not the main character every film you see him in he's never really been the main guy he's just uh, obviously he did Peaky Blinders but that's a TV series but yeah. it was just so great to see him in a movie that is this big and he's the main guy he is the lead. Yeah, he I, said... I, I'm, uh, I'm just so pleased that that's the case because I've always liked I, him. I'm, I'm the same. I'm thrilled for him. It is nice. I think he's done five films with Nolan there. Yeah. Um, and he's played all these parts and they've got a very good working relationship, but to finally get the, the starring role and, and absolutely steal the scene. If he doesn't get at least nominated and I hope win the Oscar, it's an outrage. I mean, people are saying that outrageous. this is... This is Nolan's kind of tailor made, a tailor made Oscar movie, really, um, yeah. for Nolan for the first time. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I, 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 he, he was incredible. I, I obviously, yeah, I say a lot. You know, great acting comes from the face and what you can do with your eyes. That's that's where you, the connections made, and he does it so amazingly. Yeah, it goes through so much. You know, yeah. um, di- at different ranges at different times, and it's so tormented. It's it's really. Really, quite something. Um, the the one person who wasn't in the film though uh, was Michael Caine. I know you're going to say Michael Caine, and I was thinking that <laughs> myself. Yeah, he wasn't in there, but you know, I mean, I don't think First Nolan's the Batman type. Yeah, but I don't think Nolan's the type of person. Oh, we'll just cast him just because he's only going to pick the ones that he thinks are absolutely right for the part. If there was a part in there that uh, he would have been right for, he would have cast him without a shadow of a doubt. But I think, yeah. You know, uh, uh, I think I think Michael Caine's actually retired now as well though, so he's he's probably just like yeah, he's done because he's knocking on any, um, because he managed to squeeze him into Dunkirk as on the on through a telephone call or a radio thing or something he did in it, but wasn't he? In, yeah. Was he in Tenet as well? Just a small part. Yeah, he was in the very was like small a restaurant role. in London, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, um, and he but, see he yeah. sees Bruce Wayne sitting across from him, and that's it. <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, phenomenal film. I for me, that's Nolan's masterpiece. That's his best film so far. Do I still enjoy The Dark Knight more and Inception more? Yeah, of course I do because they're just such great fun movies. But as as a sort of like a, a real amazing, you know, uh, piece of art, this for me is his best film. Now, really, this brings us around to the wrap-up in the sense that uh, comparing and contrasting the two films together uh, because we're talking about paradox like that, the, you know, all of these different um, multitudes of, of humanity that come together through this one character. That is also a massive theme with Barbie, this paradox of being one thing but also being worried about another, this existential crisis she is going through. Um, is also, um, you know, 
it's also a factor here in Oppenheimer. And I think to say that it's the most human film, that's that's pretty much the the end message with Barbie for me is it's about being human, about being yeah. with warts and all for all of our mistakes as as much as our triumphs. It, the idea is this, you know, we are human and that is enough. You know, I'm just Ken and that's enough. You know, it's yeah. that's the, you know, there's the parallel as well for me with, with these two movies. There's paradox and there's humanity and they both have a lot to say about about these these topics. And I think, yeah, I agree. And I think it's the, it's the modern topic of cinema. You know, we... Um, you know, it's always said that you know, depending on the politics of the time and and the, and what's going on socially, certain periods of film have a certain reflection that they do certain things. And I think what we're seeing now, if you think back to F and Everywhere All at Once last year, uh, and you think of films like this, the pattern that's emerging is um, self discovery, existentialism, um, you know, some nihilistic tendencies. This is the things that you know and. Humanity being, you know, a multifaceted being, existence that yeah. it cannot just be defined by good and bad, or male yeah. and female, or or science and uh, mysticism. You know, it's it's like all of these things are 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 many threads that lead to the same vanishing point. You know, like you were yeah. saying before about the editing techniques. That's kind of. Um, where I thought there was so many parallels for two movies that on the surface are completely opposite. You know, one yeah. is complete, uh, you know, um, it's like about a plastic toy. The other one is about a, a very real um, uh, atom bomb that was created yeah. and a historical. But in so many ways, these films are so similar in terms thematically and subtextually. Um, yeah. that's why I sort of when we come back and you've seen them both and you start to sort of think over them uh, after a few days this is what those kind of conclusions that I came to this idea of humanity this idea of um, uh, you know a paradoxical existence um, was what they had in common yeah absolutely I think they it's exactly it that's what they, they, they are they are so similar because I guess the word is existence. They're dealing with existence. Yeah, it is. It is. And, and what it is to be human and have that human existence. And it's like one of, of Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer ironically reminds us that, you know, death is always at knocking at the door and that we've got this threat of still in today's modern age of, of being wiped out and annihilated by nuclear weapons. So it reminds us of death in that sense. But Barbie also... Uh, it reminds us to be alive, to live yeah. each day, you yeah. know, and to and to uh, be, you know, just to be ourselves is enough, and to get busy living, cel- you know, continue your life celebration, as uh, Alan Ginsberg said. But yeah, amazing. Here, without looking, and you might know already. I'm not sure if you do, but if you don't, don't have a look. But um, which of these two movies had the biggest budget? Um, I'm guessing Oppenheimer had the biggest budget. That's what I would guess too, but the budget was $100 million on that. Barbie is estimated at 128 to $145 million. Really? Um, yeah, but when I thought about it afterwards, you know what a lot of that money probably got spent on was the, the music and different things like yeah, that. Yeah. Whereas Oppenheimer's got a score, and that's that. Pay uh, Goranson off, he's done. We paid for the music, but with <laughs> Barbie, she actually went to people whose music she wanted to see in the film and showed them little scenes from it and said, you know, like, I, I want your music for this or for that. And they probably had to pay a hell of a lot of money to um, to do yeah. that or that little bit more. I mean, obviously, it's cost a lot of money to create those amazing sets and everything as well. But like yourself, I would have assumed, of course, Oppenheimer's got a bigger budget. Of course it has. Shot in IMAX, for fuck's sake. <laughs> <Shot> in <laughs> IMAX. The, one, the one thing I know is that a lot of the um, the cast for Oppenheimer um, took big cuts, you know, like Downey Jr., usual commanding fee is 10 to 20 million. He took only about 4 million, I think. And that's been a common theme across the cast because they all want to work with Nolan. Yeah. He, he draws it in and he can bring the price down to fit within the budget. Greta Gerwig probably didn't have that luxury and had to pay out yeah. whatever the cost is for the cast. So um, 
because that side of that it. probably costs money as well. But yeah. as it turns out, Barbie as the, is the one that's made all the money, as we mentioned earlier, three hundred and sixty odd million worldwide in the first weekend. That's incredible. It's it's, incredible. it's actually uh, beat records because it's the first film to do that. That's not part of a massive IP like Star Wars or Marvel or something for a long, long time. So good for her. She's come from an independent background. She's come from that sort of like you know side of of film that is a little bit less money but more artistic sort of style so to see somebody like that in the modern age do so well financially as well uh, i think is fantastic really great and of course uh, uh oppenheimer made 180 million already so it's paid for itself and then some and it'll still keep yeah. going more and more people are going to see it so uh, and it's wonderful as a combination that they've both done so well um, yes. Hopefully, this gives um, Greta Gerwig the the um, same kind of uh, afforded opportunities that Nolan achieved. You know, yeah, he did the same thing. Absolutely. So I think uh, this will happen, which is really great. Another director to come in and, and do some amazing things. Well, then they're but, both um, going to get nominated for the best director. Surely. Yeah, of course they are. But uh, it's also been a wonderful uh, uh, weekend for cinema. You know, I've seen yes. lots of reports online. Cinema's packed. It was packed when, it was we, packed went. when we went. Um, we went to see yeah. three films this weekend at the cinema. We also watched. The Dial of Destiny, which I've seen before, but you haven't seen it yet, so when I went again to watch it with you, and that was packed. So yeah. all of this, oh, Indiana Jones is rubbish and it's not doing well. Well, the cinema was still packed, and there was a round of applause after the uh, film finished was, yeah. when we watched it. So, you know. But the, 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 uh, I've been mean, reading a lot of line of other places. It's all been packed, it seems. It's been very, very busy. It's took a lot of money, and it's great to hear yeah. two films that are not... Marvel or yeah. Star original Wars or any films. of these original films Not doing really well yeah, and uh, and being Love so it. good and, and being loved. So studios take notice. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's what people want. Great for audiences, great for us, you know, uh, that we, we're not just going to see, oh, it's the 20th Marvel film again or some sequel. Uh, it's, it's stuff we've been looking forward to. It was a cinematic event. It was yeah. hyped up online, and and we ended up loving both of them. So what more can we ask for? What a time to be alive, right? What a time. So one last question for you as well. What do you get if you cross Barbie and Oppenheimer? Barbenheimer? You do get Barbenheimer, but <laughs> I was going to say Asteroid City. <laughs> <laughs> I know you haven't seen that yet. You've got to watch it. it yet, but yeah. obviously in that one, it's kind of, you know, Wes Anson, this set is a facsimile in a way, you know, the painted backgrounds and stuff like Barbie Land, but you've also got nuclear bombs going off in the desert behind it and, yes. and this sign, an existential uh, sort of uh, mood is going on with that as well. Do check that out as well because it's fantastic. I think you can see it um, at home now. It's streaming as well, so uh, check that out. But there we go. Have you seen Barbie or Oppenheimer? Have you seen Barbenheimer? Did you do the double like Dave and I did? Let us know in the comments. Let us know your thoughts. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. And thanks very much for joining us on this, which has been podcast number 59. We hope to see you again soon. Any final thoughts before we check out our Dave? Well, I just think I'm I'm off to go uh, uh, beach Ken off. <laughs> you beaching him off, are you? <laughs> Beaching both what, of them off at the what, same time. What, Ken and Alan. <laughs> Ken and Alan. <laughs> I will beat both of you off at the same time. That's it for this video. Let us know your thoughts in the comments down below. And remember to like, share, and subscribe right here on YouTube. For more film reviews and articles, check out our website, moremovies.co.uk. And join us on social media at More Movies For You. That's on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all across the board. You know the score. If you enjoy what we do, please consider supporting us at buymeacoffee.com or join us on one of our packages on Patreon. The links are in the description down below. And for more filmtastic content, click one of the buttons on screen now. <laughs>